Welcome Ibrahim Tio, who is the Assistant Secretary General and Deputy Executive Director of the UN Environment Program. He's been in that position since 2013 when he was appointed by Ban Ki moon, and he has a very extensive uh, background in land use and forestry. In fact, I believe you're a forester by training, yes. Um, he also worked at, for some time as the director of IUCN, as the regional director in East Africa. And so I think we're really lucky to have you this afternoon to provide us with some high level remarks and some overarching context to really set the scene for this panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, good afternoon. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, all 3,000 uh, followers from around the world. My mother told me when I was still very young that whenever I have to speak to an audience that I should not have more than five messages. So today I have three. If I go to four, stop me. The first message I wanted to share with you is that every year, the UN Environment Program issues what we call the Emissions Gap Report, which basically tries to measure the gap on emissions. We are here in a climate change uh, setting. And the 2016 Emissions Gap Report was issued uh, on 3rd of November, and it argues that despite the Paris Agreement and despite the INDCs, we still have a gap of 12 to 14 gigatons. So, we are still in a trajectory of 2.9 to 3.2 degrees Celsius. So we are still very far from the two degree uh, uh, agreement uh, in Paris. Now to give you some perspective, one gigaton is the equivalent of the use of all cars in the EU for 12 months. So you take out of the road all the cars in the EU over a 12-month period, you will save one gigaton. The gap is right now between 12 and 14. But the report also shows that it is actually possible to reduce that gap by some measures, including energy efficiency, transport, and industry. But we also know that landscape restoration, be it terrestrial landscapes or seascapes restoration, can contribute greatly to reducing that gap. And I would like to focus you, my, my attention today on that uh, last part. Second message is that the UN Environment Program has been working over the last two and a half years into what we call the inquiry into the financing of sustainable development. In other words, since the sustainable development goals have been adopted by world leaders, the big question is how do we get the financing to that? And when we say financing, I'm not only referring to public financing, but actually to private financing and how the markets could actually influence the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. Because we know that public financing is just a fraction of what is needed to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. Governments have a very important role to play in removing barriers and in creating the conditions for private sector investments in order to shift from a fossil fuel development pattern to a sustainable development pattern. But we also know that governments cannot actually provide the financing that is needed. The financing coming from government is actually collected from taxes, and these taxes are generated from businesses, including uh, businesses run by companies in, for all, over, all over the world. How, therefore, can we shift the um, interests of the private, private sector from a sort of exploitation to a management of landscape. How, do we, how can we achieve the ambitions of feeding the nine billion people, of actually living sustainably, sustainably in this world without further deteriorating, the, uh, de de degrading the environment, without for further depleting forests and landscapes. So in other words, investments that are needed for agriculture and for other uh, uh, activities will have to be done in a way 
that would not be in contradiction with our ambition to conserve our forests and to restore our landscapes. In the jargon uh, of our colleagues in the UN, they call it decoupling. So you can actually have your cake and eat it. The third message is that actually there are very good examples already in the world in, a, in order to achieve just that. And one of these examples actually is coming from Indonesia. I'm very happy to see Pakuntoro here, my, my uh, dear friend, because the tropical landscape finance facility that has just been established in Jakarta and that I'm sure he will be speaking about is one of these such great examples. I'm also very happy to see my friend Jos here, whom I met many years ago, and who for the first time talked to me about what he does in terms of sustainable trade initiative. So there are very good examples that are out there in the world. The private sector is actually understanding clearly what we, we need to do. Governments will have to provide facilities and to remove the barriers that are still there in order for the private sector to be able to shift from the old tradition to the new tradition. So it is possible to achieve concretely the sustainable development goals. It is possible to restore landscapes, and I'm very happy to know that over 120 million hectares have been pledged already as part of the bond challenge, and I understand that maybe by 2020 we can get to the $150 million. So that is a great achievement. So by keeping forests, in other words, shifting from the traditional agriculture that is degrading environment to an agriculture that is more sustainable and that will be having less impact on the environment on one hand, and in restoring ecosystems on the other hand, I think we can achieve greatly in terms of global landscapes, we can achieve greatly in terms of sustainable development goals, but more importantly, we can achieve our ambitions on climate without degrading our environment any further. I will thank you very much for that. Thank you very much, Ibrahim, and um, have a great evening. That was a fantastic start to our discussion this afternoon. Um, if I can just pick up on a couple of points there. I work for an organisation called Climate Policy Initiative, and what we're really interested in is understanding how to support decision makers from the public and private sector to invest more in sustainable land use and energy systems using a combination of public resources and finance and of course private investment. And what we really can see is that around the world there's growing learning about how to remove risk and how to lower costs. Um, but a really big piece of the equation is what one of the things that Ibrahim referred to there, which is there needs to be more action to actually change behaviour. And at the moment, we've got a lot of incentives that are supporting continuation of business as use systems. So I'm really excited to have on this panel this afternoon a number of um, well, representatives from a number of different parts of the, the land sector and the finance sector to really think about what are those relationships between the public and private that can help to unlock more investment in sustainable land use and forests. Just a couple of numbers to have in your head. In 2014, $391 billion was flowing around the world toward climate finance uh, activities. That's primary investment that's actually going toward new capital stock and sustainable land use and, and adaptation. Of that, 12.8 billion was flowing towards red plus finance. So you can see that it's a fairly small piece of the equation at the moment, but really key here is that's all public finance. We actually find it very difficult to capture information about private investment, but we know it's said one of the really key things here is learning from examples of success where new models are being trialled to bring forward new kinds of approaches. So with that I'd like to welcome my next panellist, Professor Kuntoro, uh, who has a very long and eminent history in Indonesia and who is currently chairing the steering committee of the Trop Tropical Landscapes Finance Facility which was launched on the 26th of October. Before that, he was working with Ukape Empat, the president, president's uh, delivery unit under Susila Bambang Yuriono for monitoring and oversight of development. In that role, he also was responsible for overseeing the progress of Indonesia's national development and was the head of the National Red Plus 
Task Force. So you've got a very long history of dealing with these issues and I'd like to welcome you. Thank you, Kuntoro. Thank you so much, Jane, for a very excellent introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, as Jane mentioned, I've been back and forth to the government in the past 30 years. As minister, at least in three, <coughs> with three portfolios. And the last one as the head of the President Delivery Unit. But one thing that uh, I'd like to share with you is my experience during my Aceh reconstruction time, in which we have to spend 7.2 billion US dollars in four years' time to build infrastructure and all, the, all other facilities that was destroyed by the tsunami uh, in December 2004. <coughs> in just four years' time, we succeed to rebuild Aceh and Nias. There, what is the recipe, basically? And that is something that I'd like to share with all of you, and that's the genesis of this TLFF. And basically that we cannot plan, we cannot have our programs planned based on sectoral approach. And we are dealing with problem, say, sustainable development, on landscape issues, then for sure, you cannot see this as a, or approach that as a sectoral approach. In the government, bureaucrats love to see development as something as their main game. The word development is full with sectoral things. You watch your government cabinet, then you will see how many sectors are there. Energy, infrastructure, social, and you name it, education. So that's why if we want to succeed, then you have to change this. But to change a government is not easy. My experience in the Red Plus program, and we have to deal with emission reduction. We are dealing with people living in the forest. And in Indonesia, the poorest people live in the forest, in the hill, and or, or in the coastline. Those are the poorest people. And now we have to deal with them to try to reduce emission. And I was a president, what do you call it? I, I was a president's uh, uh, head of the president's delivery unit. And I have to deal with ministers who knows and only responsible for their own sector. When it comes to emission, then we are dealing with so many sectors. After a while, I understand that things will fail if we just proceed like that. So we change our, our approach, and we call it the beyond carbon, in which we are dealing not immediately with emission, but the crux of the problem, and that's poverty. So poverty alleviation is the approach, because we see without poverty alleviation, then deforestation will still on, forest fire will always be there every year, and you name it. This is something that is really very valuable. Why is it so? Now we enter to a new era in which sustainability is the biggest issue. One case that is really disturbing me from the early Millennium, Millennium Development Goal program is that we have, so, we, have, we have nine goals. One of the indicators of the goals is mortal, maternal mortality. In 2004, it was 208, and we have to reduce it to 120 per 10,000. What happened? in the year 2015. Instead of reduced, it's increased to 280. 
Unbelievable. Why is it so? Because there is no ministry of maternal mortality. So all ministers blaming other ministers, this is your area of responsibility. Is the responsibility of the Ministry of Health? Is it Ministry of Education? Is it Ministry of Public Works who has the responsibility to provide waters? These are the issue. Now we come to an era, landscape, in which for sure the approach should be holistic. When it comes to landscape, we are dealing with improving productivity in Indonesia. When it comes to productivity of the, of the palm oil smallholders, it's one eighth or one sixth of the national average. If we are dealing with 1.6 million family smallholders with that low productivity, for sure there will be big pressure toward the forest because it is them actually who wants to expand their acreage. What happened in the past 10 years, the deforestation rate went three times higher because of this smallholders palm oil estate expansion. We have to deal with them. What does it mean? Improve productivity. Smallholders in Indonesia was defined, is defined as the number of acreage a family can manage. So if it's a husband and wife, they can have only two hectares. If they have three grown-up children, they can have four or five hectares. So it depends on the number of the families. That is the definition of smallholders. Now we have to deal to improve their productivity. How do you do that? TLF, TLFF was initiated. We have been thinking about this in the past one and a half years. And after satisfied with the final design that has not been implemented, we, the, we launched it last month. So this is a new initiative. A new initiative, a kind of experiment, the first of its kind. We don't use government budget, because once you use government budget, then you have to deal with the one or two ministries, then, and then you, 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 you're trapped into the bureaucratic uh, problems. We avoid that. We purely use private funds. We are so lucky that BNP Paribas and ADM is supporting this program. So the smallholders in productive improvement means that we have to, or they have to replant. We have to provide and we have to support the replantation of the, of the plantation, such that five years later they can have a, a much higher productivity. But what happened in the five years time? For sure the commercial credit cannot be used for that. In Indonesia, the interest rate is very high, 24%. If we can use or in, use the private funds from the international and come into Indonesia with to six to seven percent, that is something that's really beneficial to all of us. So there's a combination of improvement of this low productivity smallholders and improving the livelihood. Here comes the grand element because the grand element can be used for capacity building, cooperative development, and other skills, or how to make life easy for them in the, in, the, in, the, in the five years' time before the first harvest, and also introducing renewable energy. So there's a combination of commercial loans, commercial soft loan, and the grand element. So these are the things that is basically the basic of this TLFF. And on the ground there, there's a cooperation between the CSO that, that is helping us in managing this grant and the companies that's helping us in coordinating the smallholders because for sure we cannot deal with 1,000 smallholders. We have to deal with one or two or three companies in which they coordinate a number of smallholders. This is the way 
we design this TLFF. Hopefully next year, if we meet in the same session, I can report to you what's happening in the past year. But today, this is just the design. I'm happy to report to all of you that the LFF has been launched one month ago with partnership of BNP Paribas, ADM, UNEP, ECRAF. This is a partnership, this is a collaboration, and we believe as an optimist that we are going to succeed. Otherwise, things will become much more difficult. Thank you. Thank you, Pat Kuntoro. And um, we all look forward to that report back next year and hope for every success for that fund. Just before I go to my next panelist, I'm going to ask Roy to give us a quick update on the, the votes as they currently stand and also to introduce the next question. Thank you, Jane. Okay, the results um, from the first poll were that 80% of you thought that it is very important uh, to have private finance to reduce landscape land use emissions. And 19% thought moderately important, and that leaves us to 2% unimportant. So that's 101%, but that's the results as I see them here. Um, then we go to the next poll. So we heard from some very interesting speakers now, so we want to involve you again. The second poll, as you are able to see it on your uh, tablet or phone or whatever right now, is who are the most important private actors to reduce deforestation? Is it project developers of voluntary carbon markets? Is it finance institutions? Is it the agribusiness, meaning producers, traders, and retailers? Is it forestry companies, or is it mining companies? So many options, and we would like to hear from you again. Thanks, Roy. Well, thank goodness it seems like we came to the right panel, seeing as private sector seems to be valued by our audience as an important player here. My next speaker, who I'd like to wa uh, welcome, is Amin Belhaj Sulami, the Global Head of Sustainable Investments for Global Markets at BNP Paribas. Uh, Amin has a, a long career as a trader, um, and I'm hoping that he'll be able to share some of his lessons from their experience in sustainable development, and to talk about your partnership with the LFF, obviously, but also to hear about other things like your ESG reporting. Welcome. Thank you, Jane. Um, yes, so I just wanted to share uh, with you my, uh, my experience from uh, uh, investment banking point of view. As uh, Jane mentioned, I've been uh, involved for the 29 years uh, past in uh, activities which were purely financial uh, capital markets activities. And I've been able to observe during those 29 years uh, a huge evolution of how the world of finance is operating. And one of the main um, outcomes of the crisis of 2007 and of the, all the whole host of regulations that we are uh, now undergoing in the financial sector is the emergence of notions that were not so well embedded in, in the way we conducted business before, but around conduct, for instance, and having a sense of purpose. And this is you know, a little bit inward uh, in terms of how the world of the finance is, is working, but there is actually a very important, it's, it's a very important point that the sense of purpose and the conduct are now really at the heart of what we're doing as an industry. And as of BNP, for BNP Paribas, this has been put at the very top of the agenda. So that's what's underlying our commitment to the, the, the sustainability. And uh, for that purpose, by the way, I changed recently assignment, moving away from uh, globally heading our uh, activities in commodity derivatives trading to now overseeing uh, our sustainable investment effort as well as our uh, research because we believe the content and the measurements around uh, sustainability are going to be very key. So that, that just to, to, to set the scene, 
obviously there is also uh, a very important uh, point to make about financial innovation because you know we can set high level uh, visions and, and, uh, and targets but we need to actually have some actions on the ground and for that uh, we have uh, the ambition at BNP Paribas to be a leader. Uh, we have already set ourselves a goal to be uh, a leader in green bonds, for instance, um, and we've been you know, involved for, for quite some time now in this market, which remains uh, a very small fraction of the overall uh, bond market still. Um, but we also have a, a various other initiatives. The TLFF is a very important one for us as a, as a drive for innovation. We are uh, deeply committed. We have hosted um, in Singapore, just the day after the Jakarta inauguration, uh, uh, an event where we hosted 500 clients across the industry, investors, corporates, and it was extremely well attended and, and there was a lot of interest uh, in, uh, in what was going on with the, with the TLFF and, and, and the initiative around sustainability. So today, we are, I would say, riding a trend of much stronger interest, but we are not yet there in terms of results. It's, uh, it's, it's really an effort, and um, I would like to make a parallel in terms of, uh, of what Dr. Kuntoro was saying in terms of uh, action in the government. It's quite similar in the bank. You, you have, you're, you're organized by silos, by product line, by, you have metrics. Those metrics, you know, it's like every minister, <laughs> each, each silo has some objectives to deliver. And these deliveries around uh, sustainability are transversal to all of this. So now I have inherited this mission to find a way to actually implement uh, across the way we work, um, a way to, 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 to make that part of our business. And my personal belief is that this will come across through concrete examples, through concrete actions and successes. As I said again, we have some of them. We've been involved in green bonds. We've been involved in, uh, with the United Nations. We've recently launched in New York uh, an SDG index. And we are, uh, we are looking at, uh, we've been doing bonds linked to, uh, with a performance linked to indexes, responsible indices. But this is innovative, but it's not changing, for me, it's not changing the face of, uh, of, uh, of, of what we need really to change uh, the world and to reconcile the uh, two degrees, 1.5 degrees objective with what private money can do. So we're on that journey. We're extremely committed to this. We are re looking for even more innovation and get in uh, battle order to deliver on this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, some really good thinking around actually how we're going to measure our successes going forward and, and when do we actually know that we're hitting the mark. Um, I would like to welcome as my next panellist, Joost Orshausen, who's the Executive Director of the Sustainable Trade Initiative, IDH, and has, again, got a, a, a wonderfully long and experienced history of working both through public and private partnerships for building up sustainable trade and land use. Welcome, Joost. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks for having me here on the, on the panel. Um, I also had a mother, like Ibrahim, and she found me very talkative, so I will keep it to two messages. <laughs> Um, before I make those messages, not everybody knows IDH. Um, we are a development uh, foundation. We are funded by the Dutch government, the Swiss, the Danish, and the Norwegians. And we work with the private sector on trying to make their uh, supply chains uh, responsible and sustainable. Um, my, f my first message is that, uh, following up on the, on the earlier speakers, uh, so that there are basically two worlds uh, out there. There is the world of finance and business that invest in productivity, uh, which is private. Uh, and then there is the public world of donors, NGOs, uh, and the conservation. 
Um, and I think that's the problem. There is a huge gap between those two worlds. And if we don't bring those two worlds together, we will not solve the issue of, in this case, uh, deforestation. Uh, we signed up uh, today with TLFF as a partner, uh, with Pak Punturo, that we're very uh, excited about that because that's an, a very powerful initiative to try to bring those two worlds together. And what you just said with BNP Paribas, it, everybody wants to do it now. We want to close the world from both sides, from the public world as from the private world. Um, but to be honest, uh, we're only beginning. It's a very difficult uh, journey, I think. Um, what we believe as IDH is we're doing a lot around what we call blended finance. Um, so we are allowed by our back donors to put grants as basically redeemable grants. So we are allowed to take junior debt positions, uh, working with banks or other financial institutions uh, to basically de-risk uh, investments in, in activities on the ground, in commercial activities on the ground and then bring in kind of public good elements into those investments, okay? Um, so that makes us an interesting partner for private sector players that want to do something good and close that gap. And my message is we need a lot of that kind of blended finance construct, otherwise we're going to fail. Um, to give you an example, um, which is not about deforestation, but it's about smaller inclusion. We, we just closed our first big deal with IFC by the Calabout, which is a very big uh, cocoa uh, manufacturer, um, and us in Ivory Coast. Uh, so the issue was that we want to invest in smallholders, what you talked about, uh, but nobody's investing in smallholders because nobody wants to take the risk. Um, and we provided a million of grant money as a, as a junior debt position into that deal, and. The, because we did that, IFC was able to uh, put finance to Badi Kalabout, and Badi Kalabout is then able to put input finance into 100,000 smalls in Ivory Coast. So I think we need these kind of structures um, also for the conservation uh, part. Otherwise, we don't. So we talk about production protection. So invest in productivity, but at the same time, make sure that the private sector takes uh, protection seriously. Um, it's difficult because. In those forest spaces, what Pacuntura said, it's often small, it's often a lot of illegality. Um, so we need to come up with these blended finance structures, and we need to do it in an environment where there is real commitment from the governments. I think that's the other thing. You cannot just invest in areas uh, where there's a lot of reputational risk. So there, there is a job for the government, and there's a job for the private sector to make this happen uh, together. My second message is, there's a lot of en uh, energy with the private sector and they want to get this thing solved. Um, uh, you have heard all the, all the declarations by the, by the Consumer Goods Forum. Um, they are spending a lot of effort and money and energy to try to figure out how they delink commodity production from deforestation. And they say, well, they will fix it by 2020. Well, I can tell you they will not. Um, they will, uh, it will take a bit longer. Um, but there's a lot of energy there. There's a lot of energy around traceability to, to know where your products come from all the way down to the source, which is complicated. There are 3,000 palm oil mills in Indonesia. Um, so for the companies to know what they're sourcing from is a huge operation. And then to make sure that it's sustainable palm oil that goes into those mills is another huge operation. Um, same in uh, Brazil with the soy and the beef. So, but there's a lot of energy there, and I think we should thrive on that energy and work with the private sector and that energy to, uh, to make it happen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, and if I could ask the technician to please put up the slide um, for Mike Wilkins, my next panelist who is Managing Director at S&P Global Ratings in London, where he has responsibility for the firm's infrastructure, environmental and climate risk research. He's also a member of the FSB Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, which is going to make its uh, findings, I think, in December, and which some of us are certainly waiting for with bated breath. And so I'd like to welcome you, Mike, and, and ask you for some of your views on disclosure and also the, the um, S&P's Green Bond Evaluation Tool. Thank you very much, Jane. Uh, I'm not sure if the, the slide's up yet, but hopefully it will come up soon. Um, 
I'm going to talk to you about the intersection of the world of the capital markets uh, and private finance and sustainability, especially in the area of, of land use and, and forestation. Uh, we at S&P Global Ratings are better known as a credit rating agency. Uh, we have provided credit ratings somewhere in the region of uh, $4 trillion of debt, publicly traded debt, and we have somewhere in the region of 1,400 analysts globally whose principal job is to assess whether companies and countries and banks can repay their debt on time and in full. So that's what S&P Global Ratings is known for. Um, but as we have, for various reasons and driven by market forces amongst others, decided that we're going to move beyond the world of looking at credit quality and into the world of looking at green quality. Uh, and this is what I'm going to talk to you about over the next couple of minutes. Uh, the main thing that we're using to do that is a, a new tool that we're developing called the Green Bond Evaluation. Uh, and you heard Antoine talked about the green bonds uh, market, which uh, has been growing at a phenomenal rate over the past few years, uh, somewhere in the region of $150 billion uh, of capital markets debt has been raised in the green bond sector, uh, and that's growing very, very quickly. This year, we're actually at $60 billion just year to date. So um, we are, you can see that the growth rate is phenomenal, but at the same time, it's still very small in comparison to the overall capital markets. There's somewhere in the region of $92 trillion of assets under management by global investors in the capital markets. So $150 billion is a drop in the ocean. But it's still uh, a growth market and one which is going to play, we believe, a significant part in helping to um, increase the sustainability, uh, especially in areas of um, mitigation of climate change as well as adapt adaptation to the effects of climate change. The green bond tool which we're developing at the moment is meant to be holistic in that it provides a scoring mechanism uh, for assessing how green the bond is. Uh, so we're not looking at how credit worthy the bond is but how green it is. The way we do that briefly is by looking at four different categories as you can see on this chart. Uh, the first two being transparency and governance. And for those of you who are familiar with the green bond market, you may have heard of the green bond principles, which add a level of discipline to the market by giving uh, reporting guidelines, ensuring that there is uh, sufficient disclosure and general discipline uh, to the market to uh, give investors comfort that they are not going to be greenwashed uh, by the bond issue. Uh, so that's something which we're going to be looking at in, in the evaluation tool. But we're also looking at green impact which is more important because green impact is essentially providing a relative ranking of how green the bond is from an environmental impact perspective. And we're, we're using a, a, a technology and a, a development uh, of a tool which has been done by a, a company called TrueCost, which is now part of S&P Global, uh, to assess the net benefit analysis um, of mitigation projects. So for example, renewables, we assess the amount of carbon emissions saved by, by wind power, by solar, and we will rank that according to other types of technologies relative to a local baseline for the whole life of the project. And this will be the same for other environmental key performance indicators such as water and waste and so on. Um, and of course, uh, land use is something which we also plan to include as one of the environmental key performance indicators for green bond evaluations. Although at the moment, uh, uh, land use and forestation bonds only account for around 2% of the total green bond market that is uh, set to grow forward as more and more private sector investors are interested in benchmarking their investments and also putting their money to work in sustainability initiatives. And the reason that's been driven is by a number of initiatives, including what Jane said, the work being done by the FSB, the Financial Stability Board Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosure, which is set to release its report uh, very soon. And this will be a voluntary uh, set of standards which will uh, encourage, uh, strongly encourage, I should stress, uh, companies and financial institutions to disclose their climate-related risk so that investors and lenders and insurance underwriters can make more 
uh, um, better decisions on where to allocate their capital. So this is very important, the disclosure side is important, and we include that in our tool, uh, and that's going to drive investors to allocate their money because these disclosures and these disclosure recommendations lead to policies such as Article 173 in France, which uh, asks uh, companies, investors, to disclose their carbonization pathways. So this kind of uh, regulation and this type of new legislation coming in across the world will make investors uh, go into green investments and the green bond market is by far the biggest and most, most liquid. And then finally, um, on adaptation, um, you know, 98% uh, of green bonds are focused on mitigation projects, but adaptation, uh, while it's been the poor cousin in the green bond market so far, will grow considerably in our opinion. We are now starting to see more and more green bonds uh, aimed at adaptation, uh, increasing the resilience of types of, um, of uh, uh, communities and cities to the effects of either acute or chronic um, climate change physical impact. And we will measure that in terms of damage reduction, but also, and importantly, uh, how the proceeds of the bond will be uh, adding to um, making communities more sustainable uh, and also uh, the humanitarian and civil and ecological benefits brought about by the bond. Again, this is all done on a relative basis. So just to finish off, uh, while we know that investors have been asking uh, how green, uh, sorry, how creditworthy my bond is for many years, and they're now starting to ask how green their bond is, and what we believe will happen is that bonds will be priced according to their greenness as they have been for a number of years based on how credit worthy they are. Thank you. Just before I come to my final panelist, I'd like to ask Roy to give us another update on question two and to present us with the final poll, please. Okay, I want to share the results of the poll with you again. Um, so to do that, I'll quickly vote, and I'll vote for the one that won because I already know. Um, that's this one. Um, Agribusiness has got 69% uh, of, the, of the votes. Uh, finance institutions came in second at 14%. Forestry companies third at 8%. And mining companies and project developers of voluntary carbon markets are both in the last place. Um, so that's the result of this poll. Then we go to our next one, which is... Um, should be popping up soon. Yeah. So what is the most important role of the government to unlock private finance? Is it to reform agricultural subsidies? Is it to clarify land tenure? Is it to clear protection policies, moratoria? Or is it to certainty, certainty of revenue, that is price floor sustainable commodities or carbon credits? So I'll leave it to you again and we get back to the results later. Thank you very much, Roy. And I'm so glad that's the last question because actually I'd like to ask that question to my panelist, Pat Contoro. What is the role of government? Um, you've got so much experience in this. We've talked a lot about private investment. You've talked about the, the new fund. And one of the striking things about that fund is, is that it's using private finance. But what is the role of government in actually making sure that you can achieve the impact that you're wanting to achieve? Government is very important, but they better not interfere with the <laughs> process of uh, the so-called landscape development or improvement or things like that. The government function is very significant in the setting of the right regulation. Regulation of funds flowing from abroad to the ground. Funds in terms of commercial and the ground.
the usage of the government budget directly by private organization, whether it's business or CSOs. The other important function that should be taken by the government is enforcement of the legislation. And one of the most important legislation that we need in this is the jurisdiction of the acreage. And that is the utmost important. Because we assume that the poor smallholders, once they improve their productivity, then their appetite or eagerness to deforest will slow down or gone. No, that assumption can be wrong. The only way to curb such that the assumption is right is by enforcing the legislation. So these are the three things, I believe, that's really important to be done by the government. Thank you, great answer, and I know that um, you, you've been working on production and protection as well, so I'm sure that you would definitely agree with that final remark. Yeah. Um, I'd like to welcome my final panellist, Chris Botsford, who's the CEO at ADM Capital and who has a long experience of investing in Asia, but particularly I'd be interested to hear about some of your thoughts about Indonesia this afternoon and um, the role that you have in actually unlocking investment for smallholder farmers. Thank you very much. Um, well, first of all, we uh, um, looked at the scale of the problem because there are many, many pilot projects in most emerging markets. Most of the environmental degradation that's going on in the world at the moment is in emerging markets, and most of the capital is in the developed markets. So we started looking at what type of money there is and how we can get the money coming from developed markets into the emerging markets. To put it in an Indonesian context, because that's the, the current focus here on the panel, uh, if, if we look at the amount of degraded land, it's about 20 million hectares that's inefficiently or very inefficiently used. It costs about 7,000 US dollars per hectare to uh, grow long-term plantations there or, or uh, cocoa or other, other type, type of product. And so that's about $140 billion of investment required. And the other thing is, what type of money is required? Most banks in, in emerging markets, the longest they will lend for is five years. Well, take palm oil, it takes five years before you get any, any product coming off it. So five-year debt is, is pretty useless. So we started looking at what is it that could bring private capital around the world, and the, there's so much private capital in, in developed markets that we have negative interest rates. So it's not that there isn't capital, it's what can we do to get that capital to come into the markets to, to invest in these areas that are, that are so vital. And we looked at two things, that, that when, you, when you investigate what goes on with smallholders or what goes on in the farming community, there's the, 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 the initial period of planting uh, through to when the plants or the trees begin to yield fruit. And that's quite high risk. But then once the, the plants are producing fruit, producing crops, actually a lot of that goes towards very good, reputable companies, Unilever, Mars, Nestle, and so on. So we said, well, why can't we divide this up? That the first bit, yes, it's high risk, it should be risk capital, but as soon as these plants start to yield crops, then we'll get offtake contracts. Those we can securitize and then put out into the international markets. The second part of it was how do you work out where all this uh, palm oil or cocoa or rubber or whatever is coming from and control it? Because at the smallholder level, uh, it's, it's very disparate and very difficult to see. Fortunately, the rate of advance of the smartphone and technology has meant that in the past four or five years, these things have become much, much easier to track. And even, even this morning at the sessions we've had here, I think most people that attended the technology session 
would have been amazed at what's gone on in the past year. I mean, it is so exciting and so encouraging that I think that, that we can beat this and I think we can bring capital in in good scale and I think we can really, really make a very big impact. Thank you very much. Now, before I open up, what was the role of government? So, um, the result of the final poll of the day, um, I'll just choose one here. Um, let's wait for the internet. So the results, um, the winner here is to clarify land tenure that got 50% of the votes. Um, second place is shared actually, reform agricultural subsidies and to have certainty of revenue um, are both in the second place. And the last one is to clear protection policies or moratoria. So that was the last poll uh, of the day. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that. Now we have some questions coming through, but first of all I'd like to invite a couple of questions from the floor and I'd like to ask you to raise your hand so that we can get a microphone to you, but also that you can identify yourself and if possible direct your question to a particular panellist. Okay, I've got two over here, please. Is there somebody with a microphone? Sorry if you can put your hand up. Okay. I'm just going to ask one of my team here to run a microphone. Thank you. Uh, okay, my name is Brenda Ojos. I come from South America. Uh, I studied process engineering, so I was asking me uh, during all the uh, talking with the panelists, uh, is it necessary to invest more to, rep to do our representation or uh, is it important to, to migrate our actual uh, model of finance and economy to a one more circular. I mean, if it's necessary to not only to give money, to do something different because it's necessary to uh, migrate, right? To change the, the patrons. So that's why, that's my, basically that's my point of view. So I'm asking me that. Which one is more important? One is more important than the other, or is it necessary to have the two? Thank you. Thank and you. There's another one up the back. Hi, my name is Chris Kasperzak. I work for the National Wildlife Federation based in the United States. Um, my question is about how to communicate the and what you all have found in your communications with companies and about the green bonds. What is the most convincing argument and evidence for companies that they need to shift their investment from traditional supply chains into um, sustainable supply chains? Thank you very much. And I'm actually going to ask Roy to choose a question from our online audience. Okay, so you guys have been upvoting questions as they came in through Slido. Um, I'm going to ask the most popular one. So it's from Andrew Callister, and he asks, financial returns from landscape restoration are often long-term, more than 20 years. How can we encourage the financial sector to provide more patient capital? Thanks, three great, great questions. I'm going to start with those. Um, you st I actually heard you commenting on the circular economy, so I'm going to ask if you could possibly um, comment on that. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think you're right. We need, or my answer would be, we, we need both. Um, we, we, need not, we should not just be financing the same thing and then hope uh, things will change. Um, 
what you see now is that the private sector starts to integrate uh, carbon measurements over their full supply chain into their business, right? Um, what I have learned in working with business is that business likes numbers. Uh, if you can put it to a number, then they can work on it, right? Um, the problem with deforestation is it's not really a number. Um, carbon, you can measure, right? So what is the total carbon footprint of your business, including the, the, the carbon uses of your consumers even, right? Not just the supply chain, but the other, the other side as well. And then it needs to become uh, circular. Um, so carbon measurement and integrating the carbon measurement of the total footprint, I think, is the, is the way forward for companies. Uh, Unilever has done it. Uh, Puma has done it. And now other companies are coming up. Uh, that are starting to do it and also start to publicly disclose it. Uh, and the moment you have that, then you can say, okay, next year I want to be 5% more efficient on my carbon until they reach uh, carbon neutrality or even a carbon surplus. So in that way, I think they can work on their, on their circularity. Thank you. Thanks. And I think that's a really good segue actually into the next question, which was about how to communicate the risk of deforestation. I was wondering, Mike and Amin, if you could actually both comment on this one, because I think you, I mean, you talked about how to actually measure sustainability. Um, and I certainly know that in the field of private finance, we're having difficulty coming up with some metrics, for example, in the field of adaptation, how to know when you've had your impact. And Mike, with your views on disclosure, I was just wondering if both of you could comment on that. Sure. Um, within the uh, context of the uh, green bond sector, um, in terms of land use and forestation, we're, we're currently working on what would be the best way to measure the, the green impact. Um, for example, uh, we have a number of offset uh, areas where we measure the impact, carbon, uh, water uh, being two main ones. Um, for example, in, in carbon, the environmental key performance indicator could be looked at in terms of carbon sequestration as a result of incre increased vegetation coverage. Uh, and for water, we could look at the increased water retention and stability uh, in soil as a result of plant coverage. So this is, of, of course, for land use type of projects. And for, for forestation, I think it's going to be something similar. But we, we are in the, in the process of developing what are the specific environmental key performance indicators. And then once you've developed that, you can start to measure projects on a, on a relative ranking basis. So uh, the investor in the green bond can see uh, how they get the most bang from their buck from an environmental perspective. Uh, in terms of the uh, Financial Stability Board uh, task force uh, work they're doing, they, they have included forestry, uh, pulp and paper producers as part of the uh, specific sectors that they are looking at. And uh, the, there are 11 recommendations covering governance, risk management strategy, and metrics and targets, and there are specific metrics and targets that are being done on a sector-specific basis. So um, the, the forestry, the agribusiness, uh, and the pulp and paper business are included in those sector-specific recommendations. And if you, you can drill down into those, for example, and look at sort of water metrics and uh, soil erosion metrics, which will be included. So this is at the level of detail that's going to be requested from companies in their pu public financial filings. And that will lead investors to be able to see what the risk is uh, of their investment in terms of uh, land use and forestry uh, type of, of, um, of investments in either in companies or in specific debt instruments. And just one final comment from me. There was, a, there was another question about uh, long-term investing. And I think that's uh, one thing that's been looked at by the task force as well in terms of tapping into patient capital. Uh, Mark Carney, who's the uh, chairman of the FSB as well as being governor of the Bank of England, uh, recently said in a speech in, in Berlin uh, that the tapping into the $100 trillion worth of patient capital which exists is one of the major objectives in trying to achieve long-term financial stability and also uh, improve macroeconomic stability in current times. And that's something which he believes can be done through climate finance. So we, we are talking much broader than just climate finance here. We're talking about global finance and its stability and the transformation of the financial system as a whole. I think you summed it up. Uh, I, would just, uh, I would just add that uh, also, interestingly, what, there is a sector of insurance which is uh, very, very immediately um, impacted 
not specifically on forestry, but generally the physical risks are impacting the insurance sector and they have to develop these kinds of uh, measures very quickly to, to, to face the risks that they are supporting. So I, I'm hopeful with all these efforts we'll have uh, much better data to do these analytics. Thank you for raising that. We haven't actually talked about insurance this afternoon, but it certainly is important, not just in dealing with risk, um, but in, in building resilience, I think, over time too, for some of these smallholders particularly. Can I ask for some more questions from the floor, please? I've got one here. If we can get a microphone down here, please. Can I ask you to read out a question from our online audience in the meantime? Okay, so the second most popular question online was from Chris, without surname. Do you think that private finance is more efficient than public climate finance? And if yes, how can they monitor money flows and results transparently? Thank you, sir. Robert Gibson, Hong Kong. Please can um, Standard & Poor's Green Bond tool be modified and adapted to provide a value for the public finance that's going in. At the moment, um, something really great such as IDH is taking junior debt, so high risk, which effectively has a high present value per dollar provided, it tends to get added up and given the same value as a, another institution providing debt on straight commercial terms. And it would be nice and it would encourage more people to do what IDH does if we can see who is really putting their skin in the game where it's liable to get hurt. Thank you. And can I see if there's one more question from the floor? Down the front here. Yeah, thank you. My name is uh, Arne Thies. I'm, uh, uh, I did 30 years about, uh, did 30 years uh, environment impact ass assessments for different donor organizations. And I must say that the results were not very, very good. And uh, now we started a completely different approach, which is uh, chasing um, uh, proven examples, let's say niche solutions, yeah, which are providing answers to, to those problems which we are tackling now. And uh, actually, uh, we we did one example in, in the Congo, it was about uh, uh, autonomous uh, sustainable water supply, drinking water supply. So we identified experts, we brought them to Benin, yeah, and uh, started a pilot project, just four showcases. And uh, the target people, which were mainly women's associations and uh, villages and so on and so forth, and collected 42,000 euro. Yeah, so from grassroots level, people which normally do not have any money, because they were very convinced, let's say, of this kind of approach. I just uh, wanted to show this kind of example, that I had the feeling that we are often dealing a little bit too much top down, and uh, don't give really, uh, let's say, the chance of the people uh, providing answers, uh, which are definitely, let's say, real and good answers. Yeah. And, but they are not, let's say, uh, in, uh, you know, in line with uh, investors. Yeah. Uh, so that is, yeah, that is my question, Mary. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, can I ask somebody from the panel to volunteer for that last question? Pak Kuntoro, perhaps? Top down, as you mentioned and bottom-up should be combined. When it comes to landscape, is, as I mentioned, it's very, it's, it's a holistic approach. You deal with productivity improvement on this side. On the other extreme, you're dealing with livelihood. When it comes to livelihood, my heart say that women is much more effective as the entry point to improve livelihood. When it comes to capacity building, training, it is the women. My experience in Aceh says so. I've lived in, uh, in Aceh for four years, and that's my 
experiment there. Start with women when it comes to livelihood. Now we talk about landscape. Landscape consists of so many issues there. Land, forest, river, plantation, supply chain, everything there. When it comes to commercial funding, credit, in which you have to pay interest, then these are the only things that can deal with improvement of productivity. Because as Chris mentioned, after six years, then you can start dealing with the repayment of those kind of things. But between the day one and six, uh, year six, then you're dealing with livelihood in, in terms of improvement of the uh, welfare of the people. So these are the two things that should be happening there. The question is, who will be the actor in managing all this? At the upper layer, it's the banks, it's the CSO, but at the ground, it is the people themselves. The company, the smallholders, the people, and that people means when it comes to capacity building is the women. That is how I see things. Thank you. Thank you, Pat Quintor. Mm -hmm. um, can I now ask, sorry, I wrote it down. Okay, um, is private finance really more efficient and how do we monitor it, monitor it transparently? I'm wondering who would like to answer that question. Just. I'd like to give it a try at least. Um, well, obviously private finance is more efficient than public finance because private finance wants its money back, right? Um, um, so there is a very there is an inbuilt mechanism that that it it, it adds value to to the investment. Um, the problem is, private finance doesn't want to engage in difficult areas like landscape investments. Um, so we need to allow private finance to find it less risky uh, to invest in those more complicated uh, and more riskier. Uh, ventures like, in this case, conservation and production protection. So that's why I was saying we need both. We need public finance to de-risk the investments of the private sector and help them to engage in those more complicated uh, spaces. I was really happy what you said about green bonds and that 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 pricing will be against will be the, the, the level of greenness. Uh, hopefully, right. Uh, what I hope is that. There will be, in the future, there will be jurisdictions where private sector finds it more um, attractive to invest because the governments of those jurisdictions are strong on the green side, right? And that it becomes less pricing. So the price for money to invest in jurisdiction A will be lower than the price to invest in jurisdiction B. So it's this public-private thing which I think is going to be the answer to, uh, to many of those questions. If I can just add on that, there's a, another issue for the uh, private sector getting involved is that most of these, uh, or most of the demand for money is from emerging markets, and you have uh, a factor called currency risk in there, uh, because most of the farmers don't want to be taking currency risk, so they borrow in, in local currency. If, if, as we saw back in 98 in Asia, uh, we forced dollars on people uh, back then, quick uh, recap, there was a fixed currency in Indonesia, for example, at 2,400 rupiah to the dollar. Within a month, it had gone up to 16,000. Well, if you're a poor farmer that's borrowed a whole lot of dollars, suddenly you're bankrupt and your farm is taken away. So uh, we, have to, we have to manage the FX exposure and also the commodity exposure, taking palm oil, um, you know, prices halved. You have to have a flexible structure that can take that into account. Most private sector money isn't designed that way. And that's where we need the public-private uh, partnership. Mike. Yeah. Maybe uh, just to add a couple of words along the similar lines. Uh, uh, I'm actually an infrastructure and project finance analyst. So I'm used to the world of PPPs and the way that um, PPPs are measured from a value for money perspective. Uh, in the world of infrastructure, and this is not just energy or transportation. It could be a social infrastructure, such as schools or hospitals. Um, or, or government buildings, 
or even accommodation. Um, value for money is measured not just on the, the cost of debt, because one thing you have to realise that is usually that the private sector debt is more expensive than the public sector um, for a number of reasons. Um, but effectively, once you take into account the whole life uh, value for money aspect in terms of how the private sector in a PPP through its uh, the concession agreement and obligations that it has to provide uh, in terms of um, maintaining assets, other obligations which add value to the project. Once those take, are taken into account, then that public can be more efficient than the public sector funding. And, and the other issue is really availability of funding. Uh, governments are constrained in terms of, of budget um, sh um, shortfalls, in terms of general fiscal tightness that may, may cur curtail their ability to actually allocate funds to projects, whether it's in infrastructure or land use or forestry. They may not have the capacity to do that. That's where the private sector can bring in extra capacity, provided that it can be incentivized to do so. But that's another question. Thank you, and if I can just take the moderator's prerogative and throw in my five cents worth as well. One of the projects that we run at CPI is the climate finance landscape, a global landscape that tracks how much finance is flowing from sources to end users. And in our landscape, while we actually can see that there's more private finance flowing than public finance, we can only see that for sure in the renewable energy sector where companies like Bloomberg New Energy Finance are actually tracking flows. It's much more difficult to see what's happening in energy efficiency where, for example, building owners, households are investing in, en in energy efficiency, but that data isn't being tracked or certainly not to the extent that renewable energy is. It's even more difficult when you get into adaptation where there's even debate around what adaptation is, where development starts and ends. And of course, with the land use sector where climate resilience is a very big part of investments, um, I think it's really difficult to say for sure how much finance, public, private finance is flowing into that sector. So this is definitely an area that we need to be improving. Now, I've just seen a yellow card, so I'm going to make a, an attempt to sum up from what I think has been a fantastic panel. I think we started off with a reminder from Ibrahim about the scale of the goal, the challenge that actually stands before us in terms of the gigaton gap. Um, we have some work to do and finance is currently far short of what we need. That said, there's a lot of capital in the market, it's just that it's in the wrong place. So we really need to be thinking about how to shift that capital towards uh, investments that make sense for private investors because they are certainly looking for returns and they do bring management and efficiency. Pat Kuntoro, you reminded us, and I think this is a really key point, that in the land use sector, one of the things that we need to be very mindful of is that it's also about poverty alleviation and the, the status of smallholder farmers who contribute a lot to the problem but who also depend absolutely on having access to more finance, better technical capacity, more skills, modernised agricultural techniques to both improve their productivity and also to uh, improve their livelihoods. On the other side, governments play an important point. They can set rules for disclosure, for example, about what companies actually need to tell their investors. They can put prices on different forms of behaviour to make it an even playing field. They can enforce the protection of forests more so that it's production on one side and better protection on the other side. And of course, we need to have good information about how we're measuring successes. But I think the big thing that came out today is public-private partnerships are already working in, in uh, bringing more money into the land use sector and there's more work to be done yet. So please join me in thanking this fantastic panel and also Roy and the online audience who have contributed as well. I hope you've enjoyed it. It's been a privilege and thank you very much.